So this is multisensory math, mastering the middle school move from arithmetic to algebra. Uh, in full disclosure, I do give workshops and teach courses in multisensory math methods. I am an academic language therapist, a CALT, for those of you who know the designation. I have been in the field of dyslexia since the dark ages before the dinosaurs. My first experience with dyslexic students was in the 1970s. And I did teach in a public school program for students who were reading one or more years below grade level, and it was Orton-Gillingham based. And it was in a public school, and so I did the six kinds of syllables, phonology, phonemic awareness, spelling rules, grammar, written language, for us up to 28 and 36 students at a time in one class. Uh, later, as I began doing private academic language therapy as a, a private therapist, I recognized that many of my students couldn't do algebra. So I went to those people in the field I knew who were Orton-Gillingham people who did math courses, and I said, would you please do algebra? And they didn't, so I did. And I've spent the last 20 years developing this approach, which is basically Orton-Gillingham based. It has very strong ties to structured literacy. And so it, how many of you are language therapists? So when I say coding, you guys know what I mean. When I say multisensory, simultaneous processing, you know what I mean. And for those of you who don't, it's an inside joke. So here we go, multisensory math, mastering the move from arithmetic to algebra. One thing you need to know is that algebra teachers consistently say they want their students to have more experience with multiplication and fractions. Multiplication, division, and fractions. What's that all about? I know all of your students are all on grade level. They all have total fluency with the times tables, and fractions are their friends, right? Okay, so here we go. So what is that all about? I'm going to start with Numbers Tell Stories. This is uh, a collection of data from the National Assessment of Educational Prog uh, Progress. It, is, it was collected by the Maryland Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and you'll notice that in fourth grade, nationally, our special education students, only 18% of them are proficient in math. By the time they get to eighth grade, when many districts are requiring them to begin algebra, only 8% of our special ed students are proficient in math. Is it any wonder that we have to slow down that curriculum sometimes? Or that we have algebra teachers who say things like, I have students going to the board to add 2x and 3x, and they're counting dots on numbers and counting with their fingers, and they can't deal with integers. So what's that all about? Well, we have research now that suggests how we should go about teaching some fundamental skills in math. And if you look at my state, my Maryland data from the same year, you'll see that in special education, not quite 40% of our students are proficient in math if they are in special education. We actually do better than the national average. But uh, this one I like as a data chart because if you look at what happens, according to our standards, K through 2, grades K through 2 are all about numeracy and place value. But look how many are not getting their fundamentals. It's the same thing as in literacy instruction. And by the time they get to fourth grade, they've had a lot more experience with addition and subtraction and regrouping and composing and decomposing quantities. And yet, when they get to fifth grade, where we really delve deeply into fractions and decimals, things start to plummet again. And so even in this state, where we do a pretty good job with general education students, better than the national average, we're still around 17% of our special ed students are proficient in math. So basically, in the way I'm looking at it, we're failing to teach our special education students before third grade. And that means that when they appear to us in our middle school classrooms, there are serious gaps in conceptual knowledge, procedural fluency, and gaps in their ability to work with number of facts. And so if we look at a way to go back, one of the things we were talking about the other day in literacy is that lots of our older students have experiences with these lower level skills. 
that you can build on and sometimes they can make more rapid progress than you think. But you've got to know that the math instruction must be, here's our words, incremental, sequential, cumulative, and thorough with adequate practice to mastery. Where have we heard those words before? So I'm going to propose to you that if you have students who are struggling in third, fourth, fifth, even sixth grades, you've got to go back and plug the gaps. And I'm going to show you how to do some of that, even as you move toward the algebra and the pre-algebra. So our kids come to us in some cases like Swiss cheese, and every child is different. One of my ninth graders came into my summer camp for getting ready for algebra, and we took our little pre-assessment, and he did a magnificent job on division. Four digits divided by nine, perfect answer. The one he missed was 17 divided by three. What does that tell you? He doesn't know what division is. He doesn't know what it means. He doesn't have the meaning behind the math. So we're going to try to construct authentic, meaningful experiences for our older students that are conceptually accurate, that use authentic math language, that they become proficient with, and there are some accommodations we're going to make. And I'm going to suggest strongly to you that we would never take a third grade student who's failing to read and say, okay, that's it. Just give him talking books and stop teaching them to read. And yet we do that in math. So even though I love calculators, don't get me wrong, I use them, I have so much fun with my graphing utility in Algebra 1 and 2, it's great. I want my students to be able to reason mathematically. I want them to know that they can assess whether their answer is valid or not, reasonable or not. Great activity. I want each of you to think how old you are. Exactly. <laughs> right? So you come in today, and, you, and my students, I say this, and it was a teacher, this is not mine. She said, how old are you, Herbert? He said, I'm 11. She said, no, you're not. I looked it up. You are 11 years, 7 months, and 14 days. How old will you be tomorrow? Did you know that we round to the nearest year? And when you get two days before your birthday, you say, I'm almost 12. That's a concept that brings it home to the students where they live. What a great idea for rounding. So as we look at some of these strategies that we're going to go toward pre-algebra with, I'm going to take a step back and talk about some fundamentals first. So our foundation skills begin with the organization of the place value system and a word called subitizing. That is the automatic recognition of quantity. Based on our neurological research in math, we know that we can visualize quantities very early on before we can speak. And this was in the presentation this morning. Excellent presentation on this is your brain on math. We know that we can see quantities. We can quantify things more or less without counting. And that part of math lives in the non-language hemisphere. But when we begin to learn our times tables, more of the language hemisphere is engaged. So that for many of our students, that place where they fall out of the woodwork in third grade, it's because, are you ready? When I say Namibia, would you say Vendahook? Namibia. Zimbabwe. Harare. So when I ask you five minutes from now and I say Harare, what are you going to say? Now you're going to say Zimbabwe. Learning the times tables is like learning the capitals of 144 countries and on demand being able to give them in one minute. So you see that the intricacy of the language impact on dyslex of dyslexia on math? So many of our students who are labeled as being, oh, I have dyscalculia, give me a calculator accommodation, it may be dyslexia. They may actually be gifted in much of math. So keep that in mind as we look at these students and use a calculator, absolutely, but use it judiciously and don't reach for it for the simple things that you can lead them to reasoning. That's very, very, very important. 
Here's a resource. I'm not going to stay on this page, but it's called AchieveTheCore.org Math Focus by Grade. If you are a teacher, a tutor, a therapist, this will tell you the focus of each grade level in a one-page simple document. The green squares you have to teach, and in the bottom corner of each page for each grade, it tells you the required fluency. That will help you target your instruction, your intervention, and your maintenance and practice. So, with older students, let's do some things with our same tools. Let's build bigger numbers. Who thinks they could tell me what that quantity right there is? That's 35,000. And using base 10 blocks, you can actually build the outlines of the one million cube. And then a student can stand in it, and he's one in a million. This is a, a, for four, third, fourth, fifth grade, and I actually have used this with eighth graders. I had them build a thousand bundle of craft sticks on a place value mat. They build, put 10 together without counting by making two sets of tallies with the craft sticks. And when they see two sets of tallies, they bundle them into 10, pass them to the next child who puts them on the tens place on the mat. And after they get 10 tens, which they list, they put on the place value mat in tally marks. When we get two sets of uh, five tally marks and tens, we bundle to 100. That's a very inexpensive manipulative. And when you build the thousand, they can see each bundle in the group. So you help them to understand that the purpose of the place value system is understanding quantity and being able to recognize it without counting. It's not just something you teach. It has a purpose. It has meaning, meaning that we have to put on. So it's audience participation time. I want you to use your inside voices. This is our core deficit in math. It's a part of every presentation I give. If you've seen me before and you know the answers, you can say them out loud. Here we go. We're going to play name that quantity. Name that quantity. Two. Come on, everybody. Name that quantity. No. Two and a half. Okay. So we're moving toward middle school. Where would that be on the number line? Visualize it. Okay, name this quantity. 18. What is 18 made into two groups? Nine. Division. What is, how many groups of nine can I make out of 18? Two. Let's go to another one. Name that quantity. Name this quantity. Five halves. And if I simplified that, which means to name the quantity in the fewest pieces. To simplify a fraction is naming the quantity in the fewest pieces. What would that be? Two point, well, not quite point five. Point, that's very interesting. I'm so glad you said that. Did you know there's no such thing as one half in decimal fractions? You can say it's equivalent, but if I were to visualize it, it would be five tenths. That's a very subtle difference. So we have to think, first, do no harm with our language. Five-tenths is an equivalent fraction to one-half, but these are pictured as one-half. Let's go to the next one. Name that quantity as shown. Four and two halves, and the simplified form would be? There you go. So you can actually teach students to simplify fractions with pictures before you go to the abstract level. Name that quantity, and this is going to take a moment, so I'm going to help you because I want to speed this up. We have a hundred bundle here. How many tens do we have? And then how many ones do we have? We have 14. That is an improper number. It does not follow the conventions of our place value system. I might get that number that as a sum of two of an addition problem. And if I got that as a sum, I would have to simplify that number by recomposing or regrouping. But could I also create an improper number in order to subtract? I could. That's a concept. So when my eighth grade students come in for my summer workshop, we do not use pencil and paper for two or three days. Everything they do is conceptual, and it's prove the problem by construction. And let me tell you something. When you put something in their hands, they are engaged. Manipulatives are learning tools, and those who do not use them appropriately 
lose the right to use them, and I have a worksheet ready. But if you are ready to learn and engage in learning and build and construct and prove and question, you can have a lot of fun in math. Okay, let's move on. So this one is fourths. How many? You just subitized. You didn't know it. But you saw four and you saw three. And you didn't count each one. You said seven, didn't you? We have seven fourths, and the simplified form would be one and three fourths. Okay. What about this one? How many? Did you count? Did you say three plus two? You just knew it, didn't you? Because it was in a pattern. What about this one? Oh, that's going to take you a minute. Why? There's no pattern. And 12 is right. Notice some people will count by twos. Some won't count at all. They'll see four and four and four and say 12. The human brain wants to subitize. It wants to group things to quantify without counting because counting is inefficient. This is my, one of my, my ideas for decimal fractions because we cannot come into a, a class and one day or Monday I say this tiny itty bitty cube is one. See that little yellow dot there in the back? That's one. I can't come in tomorrow and suddenly say that's one. The changing the frame of reference is a difficulty that's well known for some dyslexic children. So if you can transition to that ratio and proportion sort of view of decimals, you can do it first by having them construct decimals. I use, I guess I'm going to have to show you this. This is my tool for creating decimals. It's going to take a second. Get yourself art clay, and this is my handy dandy decimal fraction creator. And with the handy dandy decimal fraction creator, you can cut off tenths. You can take each of those flats or tenths and turn it into hundredths, which are rods. And then the students start to cut off those itty bitty thousandths, and they say, but it's so small. And you say, what do you think a thousandth of something is? So using that handy dandy decimal fraction creator, I gotta go once. Yeah, wrong way. One. We can create our decimal fractions. So on a decimal place value mat, Microsoft Word insert table, you can make your own. We have the fractional pieces, which are decimals with names and their fraction equivalent, not just the words, because our dyslexic children, words can be a problem. And we create a number that is one and, here's our simple representation that's just like what we did with whole numbers, 435 thousandths. So, the core deficit in mathematics, we believe, is this sense of numeracy. Knowing what two is, knowing what makes five, knowing what makes seven, knowing how to add eight and seven by composing and decomposing quantities in mental math strategies. It's that automatic recognition of quantity without counting. But there are two levels. There's a wonderful article that's going to be in your handout online if you want it later. It's an article called Subitizing, What It Is and Why We Teach It. It's by Dan Clements, and it does two levels of subitizing. One is perceptual. I see it, I recognize it, it's five. The other is conceptual, that I can decompose five as three plus two, or four plus one, as they said this morning. All of those things can represent five. So as I look at this one, you can see this one you had to either subitize or count. And if you counted one by one, that was inefficient. We want our students to use strategies, yes, but we want them to use efficient strategies. So subitizing is something we need. It's a skill and you can do it in mental math on a daily basis. Insert picture in PowerPoint and create your own name that quantity PowerPoints for your students. And once a week, you do a name that quantity. You reinforce the composition and decomposition of numbers. But what I see is I get eighth graders 
who can't do that. They're still counting on their fingers. They're still, uh, when you get to integers, imagine you're doing 2 plus 3 is 5, and si suddenly you have 5 minus 2, or 2 minus 5. And the minute you do that directionality change, many of our dyslexic students will experience difficulty. So we create students who can't reason mathematically. They can't determine if their solutions are reasonable or not. But we can build that in, in a math lesson for students who struggle, taking 10 to 15 minutes to build skills in fifth, sixth, seventh grade, will get them ready for algebra. And you don't have to make it word problems, though you could. But you can build some of these skills by teaching a conceptual version of math. So for interventions for students who are struggling, just as structured literacy, we can start re-engineering their foundation skills in a few minutes a day. And I would ask you to try to do that for students who are below grade level. And it doesn't hurt any student to do that. Here's that decomposition. Now, this is a, a, a go to the 10 strategy we heard referred to this morning. Here's your, here's a word for you. It's called a near point reference. A near point reference may be something you give the student or something the student creates that's on the desk. She can use it during the lesson, and when she feels capable of getting rid of it, turn it face down. So here is a pattern of 5 plus 2. I've decided I'm going to blow up the second number and decompose it as 2 plus 5. Circle my 10. Language therapists, how many of you are there? That's coding. I just coded my 10. And 10 plus 5 is 15. So we're going to do a little of that. These I want you on your handout to look at this slide. And I want you to put your finger over the component that's going to help us in our mental math. You ready? I'd like to add... 8 plus 7. Which one of those patterns is going to help you get to 15? Did everybody say 5 plus 2? Cover up the 2. 10 plus 5 is 15. Let's go again. How about 39 plus 7? Cover up the dot that you're going to add to the 9. The answer is 46, right? We're going to cover up the 1 and get to 46. Let's do another one. Let's do one that's a little harder. I'd like, this is a mental math activity for students with working memory issues. I'd like you to say the number 73. Say it out loud. I like the sound of that. Do it again. One more time. You got a handle on that? Is it in working memory now? Good. We're going to do 73 minus 17. Now, we could do it one of two ways, but I sort of like taking away the 10 first. What is 73 minus 10? Good. Say it again. One more time. What part of 7 will I need to get rid of to get to 60? 3. How much more do I have to subtract? Uh, what's 70 minus 4? I mean, 60 minus 4. 56. You've got to have a command of that, too. It's been a long day. So you can use subitizing strategies with a near point reference. If you're a private therapist, these become your visual review decks. Let's take one of those and say the addition sentence. Let's take that top one. Could everybody say 4 plus 3 equals 7? 4 plus 3 Let's say it backwards now, but subtraction. 7 minus 3 is? 7 minus 4 is? Let's take that across place value. What is 40 plus 30? Let's do it together in the tens place value. 40 plus 30 is? 70 minus 40 is? 70 minus 30 is? What is 7 gazillion minus 4 gazillion? Boy, what a funny number that would be. Could I make something up like that and have fun with it? You can do that with younger student, students. Do that in your special ed class. I will warn you, though, do what I say, not what I just did. I'd like you to do the ones place value, then the hundreds, then the millions, even the thousands. And the last one I want you to do is the tens place value, because the language changes. Think 400 plus 300, 4,000 plus 3,000. But when you say 40 plus 30, it's a different word. So with some of our more severe dyslexic students, you've got to rehearse that. Okay? Moving on.
You have to make sure you understand, your students understand, that there are two meanings of subtraction and two meanings of division. One is the takeaway model, one is the comparison model. You can model that with an efficient manipulative. I'll just take a simple one and hold it up right now. All right. Pretend I'm using the right numbers. <laughs> I have Sally went on 12 rides at the fair. Her cousin went on five. How many fewer did her cousin go on? So using looking for that difference, you can model it with efficient manipulatives. When we get to division, we need to start thinking about the language we use. I'm going to model this again later. Uh, but with your Unifix cubes, here's a great activity with your struggling students. Take a big rod, like 17, and say, how many groups of three can you make? Do you have any leftovers? OK, put it back together. How many groups of five can you make out of 17? Do you have any leftovers? How many groups of 11 can you make out of 17? And they keep dividing with remainders. And eventually, your language has to say that it is, and this is important, the remainder in middle school is written as a fraction. So you end up saying, it's three out of the seven I need to make a new group. And that takes you to fraction division, that linking language. All right, let's go on. I suggest with word problems, doing word problems of one type, then taking the next day or two or three days later, do all word problems using the other type. So eight divided by two can be making groups of two or making two groups. After you've spent two or three days on each type, give the children word problems and say, sort them into two piles. Which ones are making groups of a quantity and which ones are making a quantity of groups, a number of groups? That helps them to decode the word problems. Moving on, I get two games in your handout, which I am not going to spend a lot of time on because the directions are there. Use your dice. And you can play games with dice by simply rolling them in a bowl, never without a bowl. Remember that. You'll, you'll thank me for that later. <laughs> you can play one game that is just simply, come on, did I do that twice? There we go. OK, twice. Throw two dice in a bowl and see if you can name the total quantity repetitively. Students can play this together, and you just keep naming those quantities. Give them 30 seconds. They like to be timed. Then they switch roles. The other game is called Make a 10. You roll your dice, and you see if you can make 10 with two dice. Yes, that's worth one point. But if you can make 10 with three dice, you name the larger add-in first, and that's 9 plus 1. And now we're starting to see larger add-ins as a composition of two smaller quantities. We have 8th and ninth and 10th graders who will play this game and not know they're practicing numeracy. The advantage to doing no more than three dice is that you're working on numeracy and add-ins at a lower level. I'm getting to the pre-algebra, trust me. <laughs> now let's take that same game and say, what is 1 minus 10? Now you've got integers, negative 9. So you can start doing mental math activities with students with the integers. OK, one. It's magic, yes. The other game is called chips. You take poker chips, write 1 through 12 on poker chips, and the child throws the dice. The answer to the operation is the chip they turn over, and they can use all operations, including 2 to the third power or 3 squared. And now they can, they can play as long as they have a play. And when they can't have a play, they're finished, the number of chips turned face down is their score, and the dice go to their opponent. That's a good game at the end of class as a review. So mental math. How much dirt is in a hole 2 meters by 4 meters by 6 meters? Do the math. You've got 10 seconds. None. It's a hole. 
How much dirt is in a hole 200 meters by 400 meters by 600 meters? None. But it's a bigger hole. We need to start thinking of negativity as the absence of quantity by magnitude. It's not just left or right on a number line. It's not just below zero. And so we need to start impressing upon our students that when we do magnitude on the number line for whole numbers, positive numbers, we also can talk about magnitude changes in terms of negativity. This is one of my strategies. I'm going to ask each of you to take your pen if you have one. Hold it in the air. Pinch the middle. Now, I get rolls of wrapping paper at holiday time, the cardboard rolls, and I write black numbers, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and I mark off the fives. Then I do negative in red, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, mark off the fives. And we walk our way through financial decisions. So you get $50 for your birthday, take your other hand, where's your bank balance? Good job. You write a check, you find something you want to buy, give, it, give the kids the chance. What did you buy? It was 20 bucks. What's your bank balance? You write another check for 20. What's your bank's balance? You write another check for 20. What's your bank balance? Oh, you owe the bank. You're at negative 10. Did you know there's a fee? And it's 30 bucks, so now you owe the bank 40 bucks. There's only one way out of that problem. It's ask grandma for money. And so, grandma gives you 50 bucks. You owed 40. What have you got in your bank now? The math that you give them for discovery must be meaningful to them. So when you start with integers, you can model it abstractly on that cardboard roll. You can also create a number line with two colors of unifix cubes and slide the cubes along it to create different problems. So if I put my unifix cube set of five at three and I subtract five, I can actually see where I land. After you do the vertical number line, then you can turn it horizontal because there is nothing about negative that says go left but you've got to build that in. So use gross motor activities, get them up, have them do it. You know, if you want to make a number line and have them walk it, that's great. Take, you know, um, four mil plastic and create a number line that's 12 feet long. Get them up, have them put tape down, different colors for your integers. What is three times negative two? Well, it's making three groups of negative two from zero. And if I want to subtract three groups of negative two, it becomes positive because you knock out the, you know, you undo the negative indebtedness by making a deposit. Uh, so you're going to use a lot of intervention strategies. I don't do a lot with zero pairs and the, the chips because I, I find that it, it's a lot of language and many of my dyslexic students don't do well with language. I do a lot with number lines. And I do want them to know that a number and its opposite equals zero. If you have five and you write a check for five, there's nothing left in your bank account. If you owe the bank five and you deposit five, there's, you still don't have anything in your bank account, but they're not chasing you. So we can build quantities with manipulatives and then take that and link it to expanded notation and build higher skills. One hurdle for students is, with language-based learning disabilities, is multiplication and division. You want to review, and this is one of my strategies that I feel is very helpful for me in my program for dyslexic students. I pick a core set of facts, and I beat them to death. I mean, we, every day we write them on our times table chart, we build them with manipulatives, we chant them, we talk about them, and then we use them incessantly. So for my summer program, the first day they come in, they're with me three weeks, they get a string with beads on it, and we create the seven times table. I also would like you to work on high value products, products that have lots of factors. You want to make sure that you rehearse those because those are the ones that appear on tests for simplifying fractions. Identify those that are going to come up more and more frequently that you really want your students to know all the factors of and make those a part of your lessons. For calculator accommodations, just to let you know, if you look at all the sample public release questions for the ISEE and SSAT, 
Every fraction problem is one-third, one-sixth, one-twelfth. What's going to happen to the kids who have a calculator accommodation when it says add two-thirds plus two-thirds? Going to get a repeating decimal. If they don't know that link, they cannot do that problem. So we have to build in our linkages. Here's a times table chart. We're gonna, it's just one model. You'll notice there's a lot of blanks because all those other answers are in the lower tables. Would you look at the pattern? 2 times 6 ends in 2, 4 times 6 ends in 4, 6 times 6 ends in 6, 6 times 8 ends in 8. Did you know that? I can say that. 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 4, 6, 8. Could I get you to do this with me? I'm going to lead. This is me. This is you. 2 times 6 ends in 2, 12. 4 times 6 ends in 4. 6 times 6 ends in 6. And 8 times 6 ends in 8. 2 times 6 ends in 2. 4 times 6 ends in 4. 6 times 6 ends in 6. 8 times 6 ends in 8. Can I get you to use your hands this time? If our number line goes left to right, right? I want you to think of the number that comes before a digit on the number line. Would you say after me, if I say 3, the number that comes before that is? Well, that happens to be how we find the first digit of the 9 times table. 2 times 9 starts with 1. 3 times 9 starts with? 4 times 9 starts with, 5 times 9 starts with, 9 times 9 starts with, 7 times 9 starts with, 3 times 9 starts with, 4 times 9 starts with, 2 times 9 starts with. Cueing the first digit leads the student to the product. I have successfully taught that to third graders in 9 minutes, 9 to 10 minutes, the whole times table, and retrieving products out of order. So after you get the strategy for retrieving the first digit, we all know the answers, the digits add up to nine. So they're buddy numbers. One is always with eight. Eight is always with one. Two is always with seven. Seven is always with two. So now we're going to expand our song of the nine times table. Three times nine starts with, the answer is 27. And you lead them through practicing that as an oral strategy. This is one of the things that I created, and this is the one I use in my summer program. Going back to the dot camera, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because this is my string with wings. Did I did it again? I got to hit it twice. Please forgive me. Yeah, and then twice. Okay. Yes. All right. So they can you can build this with students for any times table. I build them for my summer program because I don't have them very long. And I have one group of seven is seven. As they said this morning on this is your, your brain on math, they have to see magnitude changes. They have to touch it. They have to build it. They have to know it on a physical, tactile level, creating memories all over the brain. What's two groups of seven? Fourteen. Let's say it together. Seven. Fourteen. Once again, seven. Fourteen. Three groups of seven. Let's do that together. What is that quantity? Your students could discover it. They could add on to get 21. Let's do it together. Seven, 14, 21. Two groups of seven is? Three groups of seven is? One group of seven is? What's two-thirds of 21? You got it. Two of the three groups is 14. Let's take that to uh, 28. You ready? What is four groups of seven? It's three-fourths of 28. Very good. What's one and a half times 14? 21. It's all of the number and half of it more. These little tools can help the students build the times tables, use them, take them onto fractions, decimals, and percent. So I could say... What is 100% of 14? 14. What is 150% of 14? What is 75% of 28? So there you go. It's a very creative little tool. One ninth grader said to me last summer, that's a pretty handy little thing. 
And you can also do division with remainders using that because you can ask them what's 23 divided by 7. How many groups of 7 can you make? Do you have any leftovers? So work on those restricted set of number facts. The same way in literacy instruction, we would use decodable text. And then, as we do that, we're going to increase those facts across place value. Students keep their times tables that they create on their desk as their near point reference, but you never ask them to fill in the entire times table. It's too many words. It's too much time. You just want them to construct the facts you will use that day or that you're working on to automaticity. This is an example of how I use them. So we're going to do incremental, sequential, cumulative, and thorough. Chris Wooden did a great job today with the division algorithm, which can be modeled as a rectangular array with base 10 blocks. After I've done the base 10 block arrays, I'm going to have my students say, how many groups of seven can I make if I start with 42? And I use that language because it models the research on numeracy. I'm making groups of seven. I can now see that. And so as we do that, we say, well, I can make six. I've written my facts. I've matched it to my product version. And now I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to have them do the entire long division algorithm to see if they have any remainders. And when we subtract, we say zero, so I have no leftovers. But incrementally now, I'm going to take them from 42 to 45 and take them through the entire algorithm. And now we find the remainder. And at the middle school level, we, we say it as a fraction. It is going to be three out of the seven I need to make a new group. When you get to this level, you have them doing the whole long division algorithm. On the other side, I might have five or six digits divided by seven. Here, I'm going to use that seven times table again. What are the factors? Write it in factored form. Why do those sevens get eliminated? They are some form of the number one. Everybody, what's one times three? What's one times nine? So if I multiply something by one, I do not change the quantity. I change how it's represented, how it's configured. So when we simplify fractions, we're going to write our numerator and denominator in factored form. Notice the math language, because that's going to take us to algebra. The language you need for the algebraic processing begins at the lower level. And so now, can you see the students writing in factored form and eliminating anything equal to one? So it's audience participation time again. I like to show this representation of multiplication with the expanded form. What is 37 made of? It's made of 3 tens, 7 ones. Well, I can now do that linkage between 5 times 3 and 5 times 30 and I can put them together to get my total product. By using this method, we actually build in the facility for multiplying polynomials. And I like the box method for polynomials because it, it, the place value is explicit on the diagonal. I don't have to go from here to here to combine like terms. Now, let's do a little mental math. I know you all know your 17 times table, right? Watch my hands. 17 is made of... 1, 10, 7, 1. Say it again. 1, 10, 7, 1. So what's 5 times 17? Let's do it together. 5 times the 10 is? Hold that number. Say it three times. Now 5 times the 7 is? 50 plus 35 is? And you just multiplied 5 times 17. Your students need to do that on a daily basis. Let's do another one. One and a half times a number is all of the number in half again more. It's all of the number in half again more. One and a half times four is all of four and half again more. What is it? Great. One and a half times six is all of six and half of six more. It is one and a half times eight is all of eight and half again more. Now the language changes here because we're crossing a place value. Some students will need to deconstruct or decompose to get to 12. But listen to what happens when I do that at the hundreds place value. One and a half times 800 is all of 800 and half again more, so it's 12 
hundred, what's its other name? 1,200. You've just done a linkage. So now, what's 150% of 600? 900. You've just done a linkage. What's 1.5 times nine, uh, 600? 900. You do those linkages and you link the decimal fraction, fraction, and percent, and your students will be doing higher math. My exit questions for my fifth and sixth graders this summer included them asking each other questions like one and a half times the square root of 64. And they can do that if you build it. So here's my perfect square grid. It's built on the times table chart. And in this, the children build it with a unit cube from the base 10 blocks and outline the square. We link the multiplication to the perfect squares. And then we count by perfect squares. And we do the square roots. Good area models with uh, linking cubes. Here we're going to take that concept of 1, right, to simplify our fraction. But here we're going to write in factored form, not 5 times 5 times 2, but we know the square root of 25 now. So the square root of 25 comes out of the radical, and we have 5 radical 2. What perfect square is a factor of 75? Well, I know the square root of 25. What perfect square, all of you, is a factor of 18? 9. What's the square root of 9? So we're going to get 3 square root 2. Using what you build with the lower applications, the lower models, you begin to build math fluency. When we do exponents, you want them to know the difference between multiplication and division. This is what multiplication looks like with unifix cubes. Do you see where the numbers, the colors change at the same time? Those are common multiples. And the least common multiple will be the smallest common multiple. And they can build that and they can find it. This one is for linear functions. It has a constant rate of change and a starting value. I'll talk about that really quickly in a minute. And this is exponential growth. And the children build 2 to the x power and 3 to the x power using beads on a string, beads on a pipe cleaner, or unifix cubes. You want to give them a visual representation of exponential growth. You want to do your rules for exponent, which can be done in rhythms. When multiplying add, when dividing you subtract, when raising to a power multiply. When multiplying add. You can get it down. It's a song. And then you go through all your rules for exponents, and they learn the why it works. Ah, oh, Houston, we have a word problem. <laughs> with your linear functions in algebra, begin with, and this is authentic. This is what's so important for these kids. You've got to get them where they live. It's got to be an authentic real-life application. Create some word problems that involve a constant rate of change and starting value. Albert got $10 for his birthday. Every week he put in $3. How much did he have in his bank after eight weeks? Don't ask them to do the math. Ask them to build it. And put their names in the word problems. You will have engaged students like you have never seen before. And once they can identify the starting value and the constant rate of change, you're ready to map that onto real life applications. Oh, my slide's missing. Okay. My climbing wall. Tim goes to the gym and he pays $12 to get in and $3 for every hour. And we have the students create a table of values. Here's the picture, and we create the table of values. They build it, and we do all of that before we ever put it on an equation. And most students encounter linear functions by, here's a graph. I want you to graph these ordered pairs. What does it look like? Let's figure out rise over run. All of that's a lot of words that you build onto the real life math. And so when I begin linear functions, I begin with the word problems. Then they're not so scary. And so you have the children identify constant rate of change and starting value. And when I build it, it's going to look whatever the, rate of, the constant rate of change is and your, your uh, starting value. When you build it, it's going to look something like this. So we have our starting value and our constant rate of change. If it is a decreasing function, like a water tower, 
or a swimming pool and you're draining it, they are taking away the quantity in the same increments. And there's your constant rate of change decreasing over time. So build your linear functions, your word problems first before you ever map it onto variables. When you get to slope and, and y-intercept, slope uh, intercept form, you can identify that and code it for its meaning. And once you do that and you go to the graphing, you can say, well, nothing's happened. My starting value is my y-intercept. And you'll have students who can move to graphing of linear functions in a day. Take your pen again. You ready? There's a truck. He's going uphill. Do you want to be behind him? No. Why? I mean, he's going slow, all right? And when he's going down the mountain, from left to right, decreasing left to right, do you want to be in front of him? Because he might lose his brakes. What is a truck like? Zero slope. He doesn't want any hills at all. That's where he gets his best mileage. Can a truck climb this? I can't even define it as slope. Let's do it together. You ready? Increasing left to right. Decreasing left to right. Zero slope, undefined. And you can map all that and have them do it with pipe cleaners if you want. If you want your y-intercept to be a bead, it's, you can do that. Have them model it so you can see it. That's your informal assessment. Map that onto equations. So begin with the meaning. From the meaning come the graphs, not the other way around. I do things frequently backwards because dyslexic students need to start with the words. Order of operations, you know. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. What's Sally got to do with it? Um, there's a wonderful article from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics called The Order of Ops Hop. And I like to introduce it, and this is not mine again, someone who was in one of my classes. Middle school teacher brought a giant trash bag in, and she had all this clothes in it. And she had one of the students take a piece of clothing out and put it on. Take it out, put it on in the order you pull it out. And at the bottom of the bag was a gigundo pair of men's tidy whities And here was the student having to put this on over the sweatpants and the boots and the socks and the scarf. And you understand that we have conventions in our society. Like, if we, didn't, if we decided to drive on either side of the road, what would we have? Chaos. Chaos. So the order of operations is a set of conventions we agree to so that we don't have auto crashes calculation-wise. They're conventions that we agree to so we'll all get the same answer. Now, in the order of ops hop, the kids literally have to hop on like a hopscotch, and they say parentheses exponents. Then they hop two-footed, and they say multiplication or division, whichever comes first, left to right. And they have to swish those hips. Addition or subtraction, whichever comes first, left to right. And that helps them inter to internalize the importance of which operation has to come first. And then when we solve equations, we're going backwards through the order, order of operations. We're taking things apart, not putting them together. As you go toward things like inequalities, ask the students real life, when would it be advantageous to us to limit things. And I did this for a sixth, seventh grade class. Bouncy houses, rides at the fair, and the one I used was a bouncy house and you can't be older than, you know, like over a certain height. And here is Robert Wadlow, the tallest man who ever lived. And the pictures of him when he was like in eighth grade, he was like seven foot two or something. And they could see that you have a restriction for height. You don't want a child too small on an adult ride because they fly off the thing and you don't want someone too big in that McDonald's playhouse because they break things. So you talk about where we set limits. You can have them explore things like the limits of human temperature that the human body can sustain and live and put that on a number line. Talk about realistic ways we have boundaries before you ever take them to the inequalities. Is the value included? Is it not included? Do real life applications. 
Work with real life vocabulary like product, quotient, factor, sum, difference, multiple, but also less than, fewer than, reduced by, increased by, because this is one of the big bears of middle school. And again, do it backwards. Start with the words. Ask your children to brainstorm all the words that we could say add, all the words that we could say multiply, and say, well, could we figure out a way to say this expression? And how many ways can we figure out to say it? Well, I could say five times a number increased by 12, 12 greater than five times a number, 12 greater than the product of five and a number. Get them to generate the language before you ever ask them to generate the expression from the language. And that's construction rather than having them decode. So your vocabulary right now, each of you think a way to say 3n plus 5. Say it to your neighbor. Okay. How about 5 added to the product of 3 and a number, right? The product of 3 and a number add, uh, increased by 5. 5 greater than the product of 3 and a number. 5 greater than 3 times 8. Think of all the ways you can say that. And they get used to saying increased and decreased and quotient and product. Uh, when we solve equations, sometimes I use the scales of justice and pattern blocks to take it out of that abstract level. And once we get it out of the abstract, we can take it to the language. Now, this is not mine. It's from Michael Pfeiffer at the Siena School in Silver Spring. This is his language. If you don't like it, blame him. But I have students in some real hardcore schools who love this language. Who's messing with my ex? How's he messing with my ex? How do I stop him from messing with my ex? And then we take them through solving equations incrementally. But using that language, you can successfully take them through two-stage equations on the first lesson. You don't have to spend a week on addition. So if you, if you want to say, who's messing with my 2x, the 5, how's he messing with my 2x? Subtraction, how do I stop him from messing with my 2x? And the children that I've used that language with really latch onto it, and they like it. Solving equations, the language must be simple, repeatable, and retrievable. Anything you do with students that is sequential and requires language must be simple, repeatable, and retrievable. How many groups of seven can I make with? How many pieces the size of can I make with? It must be incremental, sequential, cumulative, and, and, and thorough. And you need to begin new concepts with easy numbers, like our quantity tracking and place value. Did you know you can do the same thing with quadratic equations? Yeah. You make a pipe cleaner. Like, here's one, a good one. Make a, make a parabola with your hands. Para means beside. A paraeducator works beside an educator. Now, when we multiply something by a whole number, it makes the quantity increase faster, doesn't it? Right? So if I have a coefficient that's a whole number, I'm going to get vertical stretch. Doesn't it feel good late in the day? Go back to your parabola. When I multiply by a fraction, I'm taking part of something. So I get vertical compression. Whole number? OK, let's turn that into a cubic function. You ready? When I have a leading coefficient that's a whole number, I get vertical stretch. And when I have a leading coefficient that's a fraction, I get vertical compression. Absolute value. Ready? Here we go. Multiply by a coefficient that's a whole number, vertical stretch. Multiply your coefficient as a fraction, vertical compression. It goes all sorts of ways from there. And you want to do your modeling with manipulatives. So x plus 5 equals 9. Incrementally, as you go through solving equations, add complexity like phoneme tracking one piece at a time. And undo one operation at a time until you get to two-stage equations. That language is going to help them to literal equations, which is really difficult for many of our students. So you can use that language repetitively. When you do transformations, use pattern blocks that are three-dimensional so the student can literally reflect it across the y-axis and rotate it. The trapezoid is pretty good for that. Uh, 
Conceptual horizons, one of the pieces we heard this morning that is a huge predictor of success in algebra is fractions. The rational number project is a good resource. University of Minnesota, they believe circular models are good to start with, and then you transition to the others. I'd like to take a moment with fractions before I turn you loose today. Num means number, nom means name. Do not use the words how many to describe denominator. The denominator names the fractional piece. That will keep them from adding two-thirds and two-thirds and getting four-sixths. Two apples plus two apples is four apples. Two-fifths plus two-fifths is four-fifths. So I'm going to probably, I think we're almost at the end here. Yep. I use a graphic organizer, ones and fractions of ones, and we prove by construction again. I've got some samples of worksheets that I do, like this one where we have place all these numbers on the number line and they're all between zero and one because the most common mistake is putting one half at two. They need to know it's one of two equal pieces. Show three-fourths on the number line, add three-fourths on the number line, add three-fourths on the number line, you've just proved multiplication of fractions. You can count how many fourths you have, but you can also see the simplified form. Coloring in, my students love to color fraction relationships. And here's a sample of it. We're proving three times the quantity three-fourths, and then we're putting it on a number line, which is your multiple representations. You have to use the number line, too. And so here's a good linking strategy. This is a warm-up. How many of you can now say what's one-half of 40? How many of you can say what's 0 0.5 times 40? Who can say what's 50% of 40? And the kids figure that out. So that's a, a warm-up. So I just want to, come on guys, are we going to go? There we go. Before I leave you, I'm just going to leave you with one, one little thing that I think is very important on division of fractions because that's my end. We're patch packaging all of our concepts. I'm going to take you to division of fractions and leave you with that. So I have the quantity, I did it again, two. How many of you know why keep it, change it, flip it works? Does anybody? You want to see that? Anybody wants to see that, I'll show you after I show this. So here we go. Come on, two. There we go, HDMI, two. I have one half. And if I start with the quantity one half, it's not going there again. I went too fast. There we go. If I start with a quantity one half, how many of the quantity one sixth can I make? Three. Great. If I start with a quantity one-sixth, I can't say how many one-halves can I make. I say how much of it can I make. One-third. Let's do another one. If I start with the quantity one-third and I divide by one-sixth, how many pieces the size of one-sixth can I make? But if I start with one-sixth, and I'm trying to make one-third, how much of it can I make? One-half. Let's go to one more. It's a little bit challenging here because I want to illustrate this with our keep it, change it, flip it. So if I have three-fourths divided by one-half, can I make the full half? Three-fourths divided by one-half. Can I make the full half? Can I make more of it? How much of it? One and a half is the answer. If I start with one half, can I make the full quantity three-fourths? So one half divided by three-fourths. No. How much of it can I make? I can make two of the three equal pieces, so the answer is two-thirds. The answer is always named in terms of the divisor. That's why when I said division with the unifix cubes, do you have a remainder? It's three out of the seven I needed to make a new group because this is where it goes. One half divided by three-fourths is I can make three, two of the three pieces I'm trying to make. So I'm going to leave you with this for fun. I have one-half divided by three-fourths. I have 
one half divided by three fourths. I want my denominator to be one. So I'm going to multiply by 4 over 3 and 4 over 3, which is a form of the number 1. My denominator is now 1. Now in the traditional algorithm, we don't show that part, but we're creating a denominator of 1. Now when I multiply, I'm going to get 4 over 6. And when I simplify that, it's 2 times 2 over 2 times 3. There's my 1 that goes away. And it goes away, I eliminate it, because 1 times 2 thirds is 2 thirds. And I hope you all have gotten something out of this workshop you can use.